strip bolts, failed N64s, and puppies that are not recognized. All this and more, Print Fix Friday, episode 127. Let's get into it. Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. And if you're new here and you're having trouble with your 3D printing, remember you can reach out to us. You can submit your fails via all the social media links on screen, slide into those DMs or email us directly, youtube at 3dmusketeers.com, and we will help you get back to printing with purpose. So many of you have reached out and I absolutely love helping you all with your 3D prints. All that we ask is that you leave a like and subscribe because it costs you nothing and helps the channel grow. We have some interesting fails for you today, a unveiling of a 3D printer if you don't follow us on the socials, but let's jump into a mechanical problem that is not the easiest to solve, but also not the most complicated. Print head screw issue. So I was trying to re-level my printer because I've recently shuffled everything around in my craft room. While I was loosening the screws, I had one that was acting weird. So I decided to remove it. And when I did, I found strips of metal wrapped around the screw. The screw itself is fine and not stripped, but I'm afraid that I might've stripped the metal from the bracket hole it belongs in. I can get the screw in, but it won't tighten. All of the other screws are just fine. I've only had this printer three months, so it's relatively new. Does anyone have suggestions on a fix? So unfortunately, you've stripped the wrong part. If you're gonna strip a part, stripping the bolt is the easier way to do this. Unfortunately, the mount itself is now stripped. If you pull a screw out and there's metal on the threads, it's probably not gonna go in all that well, and we're gonna have to work on that. There are a couple of ways that you can do it. All of them require a little bit more effort than you probably want. And because this is a screw to level a printer, specifically a resin printer in this case, we don't really have a choice. We can't just leave it. It's not like leaving it is not going to hurt anything. It absolutely will. So we have to look at effectively retapping the hole. In my opinion, I would use something like a helicoil. A helicoil, this is like the name brand and you can get generics of it. But basically you drill out the hole, you put one of these doodads in there and if Bob's your auntie, you got yourself some new threads. You could also drill it out, retap it for M4, and then use an M4 bolt, but eh. I think a helicoil is probably the easiest way to do it. There are cheap kits that you can get on Amazon, of course, of varying quality, but for something like this, it's not like we're holding an engine together. And helicoils can be used to hold engines together when the apprentice puts the full 200 pounds behind the torque wrench when they should have only put about two pounds. It happens, don't worry about it. There are ways to fix it. Unfortunately, they're not all that simple. Honestly, the easiest way is to get a new print bed for this, but cost of that might be considerably higher. Quite frankly, learning a new skill and having that skill set and some of those spare parts around. So if this ever does happen again, or it happens to a friend of yours, might be more valuable than spending the money. I know that we preach a lot about doing things that are most time efficient. And yeah, time efficiency is a big freaking deal, but learning that new skill can be so much more valuable to you in the long run. And so I recognize investing that time in the beginning to learn that skill. I would do the helicoil, but I'm also the type of person that would like to be able to fix the stuff that I own. I'm not much of a tinkerer, but I'm very much someone that wants to be the warranty. I like to know how to repair my machines when I need to, at my convenience and not be beholden to a manufacturer to be providing spare parts. So for me, it's a helicoil. Next up, a rough one. This one is a rough one. This is from Stefan of CNC Kitchen. He said, no, I had a knot on my spool and it took a bunch of layers until the jam detection on the XL kicked in. Oh man, we've got a knotted bamboo lab spool on a Prusa. I'm not saying that's the reason, but Anyways, we can definitely see where the green stopped, the blue kept going. That's a really big print. And that's also a really cool print. I have thought about doing this on my XL and we just haven't gotten around to doing it. I've been having some issues with my XL, which we'll talk about later on in the video. They are mostly resolved at this point, but that's a bummer, man. That that proper sucks because that's, that's got to be a few days, right? Either way, there's really no way to solve this. You can cut it, try to reprint the parts and get them to go down. But because this is a multi-material model, you have not only the height of the green, but the height of the red and the height of the blue, which my assumption is the red and the blue are roughly the same height, but they are not going to be the same height as the green, as we can see from that photo. So unfortunately, I would probably just start this one over. And I kind of hate that. 
but I would probably start it over again because I don't think there's a great way to fix it. Stefan did decide to actually go and finish the print, you know, clean up the clog, clean up the actual wrap with the filament, and then just go ahead and finish the print. And yeah, you can see the lines. The red and the blue look great though. Good job there. And quite frankly, the fact that it only took just a few layers for it to end up looking a lot better, it works for me. Quite frankly, you could probably turn this in a certain orientation to where you don't see the crazy mess on the green. You could even try to fill it in with a 3D printing pen, sand it down, and if it's six feet away from the actual shot on a camera, you're probably not going to see it anyways this is such a cool use of that multi-material multi-color is it really that big of a deal no but if you were doing this for a client obviously that's not gonna pass the sniff test with a client but i will say the cool thing i don't see no purge tower and other than the little filament tears i don't know there it's like it's crying a little bit there's very little waste involved with the xl so as stefan is saying this print takes about one roll of filament total where if you were doing it with a machine that would have a single nozzle but like an ams like a bamboo x1 carbon this would be significantly longer and significantly more material just something to put out there by the way if you want to learn all about the log files in a bamboo x1 carbon we did a whole video on that i know a lot of you have been waiting for that kind of thing we'll car to it so you can take a look if that's the kind of thing that you're looking for so this was printing pla according to a friend when the hanan fell off and hit the floor any guesses on the temperature yes the temperature is just described best as yes boy that is a spicy hot wait a minute is that even metal yeah, no, that is, that is aluminium. What the heck, man? Honestly, I don't know. That's a lull spot back there. That looks like a, maybe a Taz 6. This is thermal runaway. I want to say this thermal runaway, but I have seen a couple of cases where the alloy of metal used in the actual, like, hot end part of it was bad, and the hot end itself melted. Pooch from Rep Cord had one happen. I've seen a few others happen as well. It appears that at some point there was a bad batch of aluminium that E3D went through, and a few of the hot ends got out into the world. This, though, looks nothing like that. And my theory here would hold because we can see where the thermistor would go and that is totally fine the thermistor is fine where that thermistor hole is neck the screw for it is fine it's back by the heater that's bad now we don't have any information regarding the printer i can make an assumption and say well that's a lull spot we know that's a lull spot and in fact i believe it's a tas6 because it looks just like my tas6 i'm not 100 sure and i don't know if it came off that machine but this would be a thermal runaway issue traditionally where the machine does not know what temperature it is or it believes the temperature is much lower than it actually is so what happens is the hot end is just given power given power given power and given power and it just goes to the nines ends up melting because those little tiny cartridge heaters are capable of producing thousands of degrees Fahrenheit, well beyond what is actually capable of the aluminium hot end that it is stored inside. It is why when we look at 3D printers for the first time, we always check thermal runaway. I don't care if it's a Prusa, whether it's a PO Poly Magneto X, stay tuned for that, or any machine we always check it because the last thing you want to do is be trusting in your machine something comes loose and it doesn't know the difference and so it will just keep trying to heat but the temperature isn't rising and if that happens thermal runaway should trigger after 20 30 seconds this was way longer than that this kind of damage doesn't happen in 20 to 30 seconds any of you would know this when you heat your printers up in 20 or 30 seconds you're not going to get from 200 and 15 degrees centigrade for PLA to what 400 degrees centigrade where you need to melt this kind of material again we could have some sort of bad mixture here or, or bad alloy I guess would be the right way to say it but you can tell this thing got hot we can see that the melting point of aluminium is 660 degrees centigrade but the brass nozzle isn't damaged and that's because it's quite a bit higher to melt the brass 1700 fahrenheit versus 1221 fahrenheit now of course alloys can affect this but realistically this should not have happened and so whatever 3d printer this came out of it needs to be tested because as far as i'm concerned 
it's a fire hazard right now. It, it was a Lulzbot Taz Mini. There you go. And apparently the machine does support thermal runaway. And then I would have to agree with, of all things, user named Hot End that the MOSFET failed. And when MOSFETs fail, they fail latched. They fail closed, which is ridiculous. We should make better MOSFETs that don't do that. But that is not the purpose of this discussion. The MOSFET, when they fail, they'll latch. And so what likely happens here is even though the machine is triggering thermal runaway, unless it is physically shutting off power, it's just going to tell the MOSFET MOSFET to turn off. That MOSFET ain't turning off, homie. She gonna keep heating until she fails. This is gonna be a whole new motherboard replacement. There is really no other way to do this. If it is a MOSFET failure, it's time to replace it. Ridges along Z of print. I have these ridges that show up somewhat consistently along the z-axis of the print. What can cause this? It's an Ender 3 V2 Neo with the Sprite SE Neo Extruder because boy, we couldn't make that more complicated creality. Micro Swiss hot end dual part cooling fans, dual Z rod with sink belt, running clipper on a Pi 3B plus. Yup, it's an ender of Theseus. So this is Z banding. This is very obvious Z banding. Just make sure that your V wheels are properly tensioned. What can likely happen is that over time, the V wheels will loosen up and they'll get a little wiggly. At that point, your X axis can skew a little bit, creating binding in that Z axis. If we go through and retension our V wheels themselves, that should help everything out. We did an entire video on this. We'll card to it so you guys can take a look, but this is just kind of binding that occurs. Other thing you can check is to make sure that your actual lead screw itself is straight. You can pull it off the machine, roll across a flat desk, and if it doesn't sound like it's flat, replace it. Given that this machine has this many upgrades, I'm going to go with that it's not going to be the lead screw itself, and instead it's probably going to be the V-wheels. While we do have dual Z-rods with the sink belt, that sink can come out of sync. And if it's even a tooth or two off, that can matter quite a bit. As I found out with my Voron Trident 300 that we've been doing on a live stream, I had some troubles with the belts. We're just going to go with troubles with belts because the belt routing is terrible on those Tridents for the front. I'm sorry, Steve. I love you, but that is truly a terrible way to route the belt unless you take the front pulley off. Anyways, it was a whole thing, but I found that when I was done, what I thought was where my belts were actually even showed that I had cut them just a little bit off and I was one or two teeth off. So my idler tensioners are a little bit different from each other. Had I tensioned them to the same amount rather than the same kind of twang on the belt, I would look at making sure that your Z axes are moving in unison with each other and make sure that your V wheels themselves aren't coming loose, allowing the axis to sag just a little bit. Is this even stringing? Ender 3 Pro 0.2 millimeter nozzle. Oh boy. And basic PLA. I've adjusted heat, retraction settings, print speed. The PLA is brand new, so it's not wet. Technically, that's not accurate. Also wobbly columns any help. It's a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. There are limitations to what is reasonable. This is not stringing. This is back pressure from your printer. Your printer is running such a small nozzle. You're not really moving the extruder a ton. And because of that, you get a lot of back pressure. You're going to have to do a massive retract as you move back and forth. Because what's happening is the extra pressure inside of that nozzle and whole assembly is causing it to ooze a little bit. So this is not stringing, it's oozing. These kind of towers are not realistic, especially at this size and with a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. I get that chasing zeros is fun, but I don't know if it is even remotely possible without spending hours and hours and hours and hours to dial in a test this small and this fine with a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. I think a realistic print where it's maybe two pieces that are of reasonable size that you would normally be printing across from each other. Dial it in with that. The nice thing is with this, it's very simple for you to go ahead and just cut off those areas where it's oozing. So if this was on a real print that you were working on, it's not that big of a deal to clean up. Personally, I think this is more effort than it's worth to try to dial it in. But if you did want to dial it in, it's back pressure within your hot end. Make sure you retract more. I would definitely look at making larger columns. I think a lot of the shaking that you see is due to either how small the columns are, how little contact they have with the build plate, or just the fact that your whole printer is much larger and is likely to kind of drag it back and forth a little bit. It just kind of is what it is when you start printing with a point two. There are somewhat of challenges and middle grounds that you have to come to understand because otherwise it's going to drive you absolutely crazy. Next up, a fail of my own. 
This is with my Peel Poly Magneto X. We have been one of the beta testers for the Magneto X and we've had it for about a month now, almost a month, I would say. This Magneto X has been an absolutely amazing machine. One of the quietest printers that we have used right up until you turn the fans on. Those fans are so powerful. It sounds like a freaking jet engine when they turn on at 100%. This printer is one of the fastest I've ever used. And if you leave those fans off, it is also quite literally the quietest machine that I have ever heard. The closed loop drivers and the magnetic linear motion system is super cool, but I am dealing with a super pain in my butt. And unfortunately, it's not all that solvable easily. This printer is currently out in my garage where I can keep it off camera because we had to keep this thing off camera, media embargoes being what they are. And we've noticed that prints just don't stick in my garage. We've had issues with the XL. We've now had issues with the Magneto X and we have other beta testers that have their machines inside that are getting nowhere near the same issues that I'm getting. Chances are it's environmental more than it is anything else. It could be major temperature swings. It could be the massive humidity that we have out there. This Benchy is the stock Benchy that is on the machine itself. And we ran this after we did a review view of a video in our Discord server, which if you'd like to join, it is at the $10 tier or higher on any of the platforms linked down below. You can come hang out with us and be able to see the Magneto X the day that we could actually start talking about it. After we finished that video review, I went out to the garage and actually ran this Benchy. We went back inside before it finished. And when I checked the camera later on that night, I saw a bit of spaghetti here. What happened is that the Benchy broke loose. It got a little blob in here and uh, eventually the printer just kicked it away because holy crap, it's fast. It's such a fast printer. But yeah, I'm loving the Magneto X. There are some small gripes that we have, but this is kind of the deal when you have a pre-production machine. It's a beta machine. It's not 100% perfect, and we get to actually help make it better, which is what I love. And Pio Poly has been amazing in getting back to myself and all the other beta testers and been incredibly responsive. I love that kind of thing. Thank you, Pio Poly, for doing that. But I'll tell you guys, this machine has got me hyped. Honestly, it's got me hyped. I am really excited about what's possible with this machine. It looks to be a strong contender for my favorite 3D printer for small business under that $2,500, $3,000 mark because retail on these is right about $2,000. But the 300 by 400 by 300 millimeter build volume is ideal when we're looking at machines that need to fit into a smaller area. Width is not as much of a concern as depth is. I don't know. It's a really cool machine and I can't wait to show you guys more. We will be streaming this relatively soon where we kind of show the machine on off. So get subscribed if you want to see the Magneto X up close and printing because we're going to be showing it off very soon. Last but not least, apparently my Prusa XL is looking to adopt. It doesn't know the puppy type and previously we were having some issues with the puppies not being recognized. The puppy boards are apparently some of the smaller boards used in the machine. This must be a thing regarding Joe's now late dog Buddy, who of course is one of the test models on a lot of the machines. But this was the error that I got. So I went to Prusa Support, who in working with me, they had me go through, pull off the back connector, reseat all the connections, and in fact, pull out this entire board and reseat the board as well. And it fixed the problem. This is what I love about Prusa Support. I was back up and running in basically an hour. We don't know what exactly fixed it because it still had the issue when it was initially pulled out and then put back in, and then it randomly stopped. So I don't know. It's documented within support though. So if we do have this issue pop up again, we can just go back to support and say, Hey, we're having the same issue. Here's what's going on. Here's what we tried. I laugh. And so did the support guy. I'm like, this is exactly what happens when you take a card to the mechanic. It all of a sudden doesn't do the problem that it was doing. In fact, I was going to be printing on my XL during my last live stream, but we couldn't because of this puppy error. So I'm glad that it's working, but it is nice to have Prusa support when we need it. I believe the issues that I'm having with this XL are temperature related or humidity related. Even when I put a smaller smooth plate on, like we used a smooth plate from a Mark III, we still get issues when it comes to bed adhesion. And that's not issues that we have inside. So I think it might be time to bring the XL inside, which would suck because it now makes it way harder to film with. We will absolutely get that one sorted. Part of the pain of living in Florida, having a garage that we don't keep under air unless it is too hot out there. So the humidity goes a little bit unchecked, unfortunately. I'm glad that it's resolved, but it did kind of throw me for a bit of a loop there. I won't lie. I was laughing and I bet the support guy was laughing too when it just was not a repeatable error over 
and over again. Let me know if that's ever happened to you because I know it's happened to me and it's a pain in the butt and I always feel like I'm incompetent, like I did something stupid, but it's like the machine knows it's being watched. But that's okay. This is life when it comes to working with 3D printers. They're not always going to be perfect. Even the expensive ones are not always going to be perfect. Love to know if you guys have had issues like that before as well. And if you do have issues like that and you do want to support us, you can do so by joining via the links down below. And at the $5 tier and higher, you will get your name in lights right next to me. Below me will be the entire Print Fix Friday series. And next to that will be the Bamboo Log video. You know, you all been asking for it, so you got it. Anyways, leave a like, subscribe if you think we deserved it. But that is all I have for you all today. Stay safe out there. Don't forget to call your loved ones. And as always, keep making awesome. Have a good one.